Please welcome to the stage, Bassam Tabara, CEO Upbound. Good morning. Super excited to be here at the inaugural Open Core Summit, talking to you all about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is opening up the cloud. I'd like to spend some time here motivating what we are doing on the Crosspoint project. Um, so I'm Bassam Tabara. I'm the CEO of and founder of Upbound. I'm also a creator and a maintainer on two open source projects, Rook, which is a CNCF project for storage, and Crossplane, which is a multi-cloud control plane. And I'll spend time talking about mostly Crossplane in this talk. So I want to pick up right where Priyanka left off, which is this dynamic between hyperclouds and commercial open source companies. I think this problem has been discussed, and it's been a super hot topic over the last few months and even, even longer. From a licensing standpoint, I won't be touching licensing. I want to motivate a solution a technological solution to this problem. I, I want us to explore how we can actually uh, arrive at something of more of an open cloud using technology, using essentially what a community can bring to this effort. Let me start with the anatomy of a hypercloud. So let's actually step back and just look at what a typical hypercloud is made of. Every hypercloud has a set of regions and fault. To, fault uh, tolerant domains, uh, zones. Typically, a hypercloud offers a set of managed services, whether they're infrastructure services, think VMs, containers, functions, or even platform level services, databases, message queues, caches, etc. cetera, um, and then all the way up to applications, uh, all the way to productivity apps and everything else, right? There are typically two flavors of managed services that a typical hypercloud would, would provide. Um, there are ones that, as we heard our friends over at GitLab talk about, wrapped OSS. So think of essentially taking something like MySQL or PostgreSQL and wrapping it, integrated into their platform and offering it as a managed service. And the other are essentially proprietary uh, managed services, ones that they've built internally, ones that they have you know, spent uh, engineering effort and the innovation cycle on them to actually make them uh, you know, formidable managed services. Typically, all these managed services are offered buffet style. You can t pick which ones you want, uh, use them as much as you use them by hour or by gigabyte or whatever the pricing model is. At the heart of every cloud is a control plane and a set of core services that layer around it. The control plane is central to the operations of the platform. It's the thing that serves the API. So when you ask for a VM or when you ask for a a uh, database that's running, you're talking to the control plane, and the control plane is responsible for provisioning and doing the lifecycle management of the resource or the managed service that you're consuming. It, nothing really happens in a cloud provider without first going through a control plane. It is a central piece. Around the control plane are a set of core services that essentially make, it, make the whole platform look like a singular platform. Things like authorization and authentication, metering and billing, monitoring, logging, all of those things layer on the platform and make it look like a well-integrated platform. And in almost in all cases, actually, the control plane and the set of core services around, around it are closed source and proprietary. It is the central point of control for the cloud provider. And if we think about it from the perspective of a user that's consuming these services, they come to a front door of a cloud provider. They see a single consistent API. They're using a consistent set of tools or consoles or CLI. And they get an SLA. You could argue that hyperclouds are masters at integrating managed services. It is a completely integrated experience. And that is a big draw. So kudos to all the hyperclouds for doing an amazing job building these platforms. Let's switch gears and look at this from the perspective of a commercial open source company, one that's actually trying to get to the cloud. So these, these companies have built amazing open source projects. They have built vibrant communities around them. And they're likely making 
money on selling enterprise licenses and selling professional services around them. Some have started their journey to cloud and are early. Others are way you know, mature with their cloud business. Um, but they all recognize that they need to be in the cloud going forward. And so typically, the choices involved in going to the cloud are they can essentially list their software in the marketplace in the cloud. It's probably by far the easiest option, because you are just putting, wrapping your software in a, a VM or a set of containers, and you're doing some work. But it doesn't, it's, a, it's a pretty small step to get presence in a, a hyper cloud. It is, however, limited. It's limited in terms of integration. You get, at most, billing integration from most, most providers. It's limited in terms of business models. And it limits your access and visibility into the customers and what the customers are doing. So most people trying, most cost companies trying to get to cloud have invested in building their own managed service offering. And that's a pretty big step to go from something in the marketplace to building your own managed service offering. And it, luckily, they can layer your, this managed service on top of the hyperclouds, and that's actually what the customers desire themselves. So they end up building a control plane for the, for the managed service. They end up building an API, automation to both provision and deploy and do the lifecycle management of their software on the hypercloud, new set of tools, CLI tools, a console. All of those things are essentially table stakes for providing a managed service offering. And then, of course, there is authentication and billing and monitoring and logging. That all has to happen. So you essentially end up with a cloud that offers one managed service. Think of it as a boutique cloud or a cloud of one. And you have to repeat that work for every hyper cloud that you will support. So it's essentially work that's done and repeated. Uh, and it's, it's what's required to have your own cloud offering. Let's switch gears and talk about this dynamic from the perspective of an end user, someone that is wanting to use, well, obviously, someone that is or likely already using one of the hyper clouds and wants to consume a set of these managed service offerings. There is significant friction in adopting a new cloud service. It requires setting up a new vendor, talking to accounting, getting all the process to get payments to work. It involves talking to your infrastructure team. They have to set up automation. They have to figure out how to deploy and manage this new service. You have to, sometimes you have to go through security and compliance. Data is being stored in some other vendors under the, the, the governance of another vendor. And that's a, that's a big deal for most companies. Monitoring, logging. And then you have to educate and train everyone working on this to actually consume the service. That's significant friction to adopting another service. And there are some partial solutions to this. Infrastructure automation tools help with this problem. They, but they still involve a lot of custom engineering. And they don't solve the problems of setting up a new vendor and everything else. There is more recently, there's an effort to try to put everything in containers and run them on Kubernetes um, across the board, which really changes the deployment model of, of the cloud. It puts us back into managing software, databases, and others on Kubernetes instead of using managed services with an SLA. So I don't think that's a fair trade off. And finally, a lot of these solutions are closed and vendor driven approaches to the problem. So let's make this, uh, let's sum it up a little bit. Imagine if you were this person, this user on the slide that's trying to, let's assume you're trying to, you want to integrate a new database. On one side, you have on your hyper cloud, and they offer that, that flavor of database completely integrated. It's a click away. It's an API call away. No need to set up a new vendor. 
it shows up in the bill, you might even get away with using it and not no one ever knowing in your organization. On the other side, you have to go set up a vendor, you have to do all this work, custom work, custom engineering work, automation, everything else to integrate this best of breed database offering with all the bells and whistles and all the great features that you want. Which would you do? How good do the features have to be at, for this managed service, this best of breed managed service offering for you to get over or get past this integration hurdle? That, I believe, is the crux of the problem that we are seeing today for, for commercial open source companies and their cloud offering. So let me motivate a technology solution to this. I believe there needs to be a universal control plane. And it would help with this dynamic. What would the universal control plane do? It would offer a standardized API to the cloud. And it's also a place to standardize automation for managed services. Automation in the sense that it's the provisioning logic for services. It's the lifecycle management of services. It's even the service-to-service -service integration across them. This control plane would obviously have to have first-class extensibility. Everybody is first-class on this control plane. There are no tiers. There, are, there aren't. We're not going to differentiate between native ones and ones that are not native. And we'd have to layer the same shared services around this: auth, monitoring, logging, billing, metering. The goal here is to offer a single surface, a single API, and a single set of tools to the end user that's completely integrated kind of like what they get from a hypercloud, and solve the heterogeneity problem within the control plane and working with the community of folks around us. And obviously, this project has to be open source and driven by a community. It can't be owned by a single vendor. It can't be driven and controlled by any vendor. That was the motivation for the cross-plane project. This is why when we launched it in December, that was the motivation for, essentially, it becoming the open source multi-cloud control plane. Crossplane is open source and community driven. We have an open, Sarah was up here talking about the open development model. I encourage you to look at what we do with Crossplane around open development. Crossplane offers a declarative API. It's based on the Kubernetes API. So the way you interface with, you with Crossplane, it's through kubectl, or however you say it. Um, it's, it's, the reason we do this is because there is a, you know, a large and growing community around cloud native. And they're already familiar with this, these tools and this ecosystem. And Kubernetes has done a great job in building an extensibility model and building an engine that could be used for multiple purposes. With a single crossplane, you could manage applications and infrastructure across clusters, across regions, across clouds, or across environments. The model is one control plane, heterogeneous clusters, environments, clouds. It hosts, it's an active control plane. It hosts the automation logic. You're able to run code that is does the provisioning, does the automation in terms of, and does the lifecycle management, which enables us to standardize on how the automation is done and access it all through a declarative API. Crossplane supports a strong separation of concern so that app owners can self-service all infrastructure and that infra owners are able to control and set policy and even own the credentials. It's the same separation of concern that we get today with the Kubernetes API that we are, we are driving forward. It's built with high levels of extensibility and even supports advanced workload scheduling, which is really cool when you have a single control plane that spans environments. You can start to make runtime choices about placement of data 
or placement of services or selection of services. So let me walk through a concrete example. Um, let's, let's talk about deploying GitLab with Crossplane. GitLab is obviously an amazing product, uh, but it's not a simple product. It's 50 plus microservices, it's Postgres, it's Redis, it's object storage, all interconnected in interesting ways to bring up a single instance of GitLab. We have been working with GitLab to actually deploy the GitLab through Crossplane on the three cloud providers. And in fact, if you stop by at booth B1, which is kind of back there, uh, you could see a demo of that happening today. Um, when it does come up, so you, the, when it, you basically kubectl apply GitLab to a Crossplane cluster, and you can set it up to go up on, to Amazon or to GCP or to Azure. And when it does come up, it uses all the managed services all of these clouds. So if it, when, it does com when it comes up on Amazon, it's running on RDS. It's running on Elastic Cache. It's using S3. It's creating an EKS cluster and deploying the microservices. It's setting up all the security and credentials. It's setting up network isolation around them. All of that stuff, all that automation is happening within the control plane, within Crossplane which means that for folks that want to deploy GitLab, we have coalesced all the automation required to do that. And in fact, that automation is owned by the folks that know GitLab the most, the GitLab company, and is available to anyone to use. That's how we see the world. And later on this year, we're going to be working with GitLab to deploy this on-premises using the Rook project as well. So you'll get truly not just a multi-cloud experience, but a hybrid experience as well. So let's step back and talk about what, how does this all open up the cloud, which was the, uh, the, the title of, 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 of this session. So we believe the critical ingredient to opening up the cloud is a universal control plane. And with a universal control plane, we believe we can tip the market to, bo to borrow from Andy Grove from vertical integration, which is where we are today, to horizontal integration. It's somewhat ironic to think of the cloud providers today as the mainframes of the 80s. But this is where we are. And if we are able to essentially level the playing field with a universal control plane, we can get to a world where we have more choice and we're not tied to a single innovation cycle of a, a single vendor and we can actually enable a whole community to contribute and innovate around cloud. It's going to take time, and it's going to take a village. So I, I'm here to encourage you to come help us, the Crossplane community, in our journey. You can install Crossplane. You can use it today. We released 0 0.3 yesterday. Super excited about that. And We'd love for you to either play with it as an end user, use it as an end user, or if you are a cost company, please come write a stack, help us extend it, work with us, work with the community to actually get to a point where we have a control plane that we can all use. Thank you.